Well, let's start with a picture. This is my family, that's my brother and sister. You notice my brother is smiling because he's the oldest child. He's the favored child when you're sitting in an antique car, he's the one who gets to sit behind the wheel. So the oldest child, the firstborn, has all of those privileges and all of those joys. I was on the opposite end of the spectrum. I was the baby, I was the youngest child. I got to wear the hand-me-downs. As Candace points out, you know, younger kids never get pictures by themselves. There's always somebody else in their picture with them. But it wasn't all bad, right? Because by the time the child rolls along, the parents are pretty much checked out. You know, they, they've, all the things they thought were important, they don't really care about anymore. So little kids get to get away with everything, right? And the other thing about that is, like, if I wanted to play with a toy, but it was my brother's toy, I would just grab it. And then he gave me my toy back, and I would cry. And the parents are so tired of the time, they say, just, just let him have it. He's a baby. Just let him have it, right? So we have that privilege, too. We don't have the first but we have the privilege. Anyway, that's my family. So let's... Oh, wait. I forgot somebody, didn't I? Now, obviously, I didn't really forget my sister. I love my sister. Um, just making a point here about the middle child. Exactly, yes. <laughs> middle children, yeah. You know what? So the middle children... I like the forgotten children, right? They don't get the privileges of being the firstborn. They don't get to be spoiled like the, the babies. And to be honest, I always tell people, my parents didn't spoil me, my brother and sister spoiled me. But the middle child is kind of like the, that, that little forgotten one. You know, they, don't, they, don't get, they, they have like the, the worst of all worlds. So today we are gonna talk about the middle child. If you remember in 1 Corinthians verse 13, Paul says that these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And hope is the middle child, right? You know, your pastor is talking about you need more faith. You know, if you want to be a Christian, you have to have more faith. And if you want to be like Jesus, you have to have more love. But when did somebody ever tell you, Giovanni, you need more hope? You know, Paula, you need more hope in your life. You don't really hear a lot about that. And yet it's, it's, it's part of three. And I think the reason that you don't really hear so much about the need for hope is that hope is both, oh, I have more to say about hope, sorry about that. So, if I were to ask you, what does Jesus say about faith, right? You would say, he said, you know, if you have um, faith the size of a mustard seed, or uh, your faith has healed you, you know, go and be clean, or I never have seen this much faith in Israel, or no, oh ye of little faith, right? A lot of quotes that we can think about that Jesus said on faith. Similarly, if I said, well, what did Jesus have to say about love? You know, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, by the disciples, if you have love for one another, and uh, love your enemies, right? No, a lot of the stuff that Jesus said about faith and about love. But if I said, what did Jesus say about hope? We don't know. We don't know the quotes that Jesus had about hope. So hope gets downplayed, and I think it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, Hope is misunderstood, we misunderstand it, and also we underestimate it. So we misunderestimate hope. So what do I mean by hope being misunderstood? Well, when we think of hope, we think of it, you know, as, oh, I hope I get that new car for my sweet 16, right? It's not really based on anything, or I hope the Eagles don't crash and burn in the playoffs, right? It's just sort of like a blind hope. But that's not what biblical hope is. When talking about biblical hope, now I don't speak Spanish, but I know that in French, espérer is to, um, to hope. And I believe if I say espere in, in Spanish, that means wait, to wait for. Yeah. And both of those words are related to the English word expectation. Right? So when we talk about hope in the biblical sense, it's not just sort of that blind hope, but it's an expectation. It's hoping for something that you know is going to happen. It's like the difference between if and when. You know, if we get married is one thing, as opposed to when we get married. When we get married is something that's definitely going to happen. So when we talk about hope, it's not just, I hope something is going to happen, and it might. But biblical hope is an expectation. And then underestimating the power of hope. Understand, I think I'm going to get the other mic. The problem might be with me, but I'm going to blame the microphone. I just changed these batteries this morning, so I hope that it's, I hope that it's working better. Um, all right, so biblical hope is expectation. And then to understand the power of hope, 
Think about what the opposite of hope is. The opposite of hope is hopelessness. And hopelessness can be devastating, right? I can live without love. If I lose faith, I can continue. But man, if I don't have any hope, that's when bad things happen. So today we're going to look at the power of hope in Luke chapter 14, verses 4 through, it's actually 21. So I threw a bonus verse in there for you. Hope you like it. Um, But when I think about the power of hope, I always come back to a story that I heard a pastor tell at Highway many years ago. And he talked about a time when he was in the park and he was shooting up drugs. And a van pulled up, and this wasn't unusual. You know, a lot of times people would come and they would give them blankets and they would give them food and they would pray for them, right? So they weren't surprised by a van showing up in the middle of this place where everybody was out shooting drugs. But he said a guy came out and he came running over to him and he rolled up his sleeves and he showed him his arms where all the tracks from shooting up all those years were on his arms and he told him, you can be free. And he said, I can be free? Never had it occurred to him that he would be able to escape that lifestyle. He was living in hopelessness, but all of a sudden he had hope. And that's the power of hope, giving people, letting people know that they don't have to live that way, that they can change their life. That's the most powerful thing in the world. So that's kind of like my mic drop moment. I guess we can all go home now, but unfortunately... I have um, some scripture. So we're going to go through some scripture. Just remember that as we're looking at that. The power of hope, the testimony that you have. You know, you don't have to live the way that you're living. You can be free. God can make you free. So would you stand with me as we look at Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. And I'll tell you, I have an awful lot of scripture today. But you have no idea how much scripture I'm not putting in here. The hardest thing when I was going through this, there's so much that the Bible has to say on hoping, oh, I want to say this, I want to say that, I want to say this. So cutting it down to this was, was the biggest challenge. All right, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, written, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor." Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Before you're seated, please join me in this prayer based on Psalm 119, verse 18. O Lord, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your word. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So reach, teach, men, send. When we look at hope, we are looking at mend and reach and also kind of send. What does it say in your sheets? Does it say mend, send? Mend and send, yeah. Well, it's actually reach, mend, and send. So I got two of them right up here and two of them right on your sheets. Okay. Man, what a powerful moment. If I could go back in time, if I could build a time machine and just go back to one scene, and if I spoke Aramaic, I would love to be there. Jesus reads this incredible scripture from Isaiah. And then everybody goes quiet, and they're waiting to see what he's going to say. And he says, today, in your presence, this scripture is fulfilled, that he is that prophesied hope. So the first hope that we're looking at is prophesied hope, right? For centuries, the Israelites had been waiting for the Messiah to come. And he said, this is what happened. This this is happening to you right now. Jesus came to fulfill everything that was prophesied about him in the Old Testament. All right, so what did Jesus say himself? He said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Everything that was prophesied over Jesus, he came and fulfilled those prophecies. There was nothing that was left unfulfilled. And then he says in John, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. So all throughout scripture, every book in the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament, we have the prophecy of a Messiah coming. And again, there's so much scripture that we could look at on this subject, but I'm only going to concentrate on one, and it's the very first one. All right, 
these prophecies were Israel's blessed hope. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later. In Titus, Paul talks, Paul talks about the fact that we have this blessed hope. This is the blessed hope in the Old Testament. All right. So as it is put back in the very beginning, the first prophecy of Jesus, Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, when God was giving out the curses for the disobedience, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Right? There's going to be a clash between you and the woman, between your offspring, that can be translated seed, and hers. He will crush, and the, the footnote there is he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. So think about this. This is an amazing piece of property. Pro prophecy, all right? God is saying, because of what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, they're going to have to live with the, the, the sin for the rest of their lives. It's something that's passed down in our genes, as it were. Genetically, we, are, we carry this trait of, of, of sin, you know, the same way that we would carry the trait of sickle cell or, or any other inherited disease, all right? But then he says, your, one of your offspring is going to come, and he will crush the snake's head. He is going to get supremacy over sin. And this is what they were waiting for, that they would have that deliverance. And I think it's really amazing when you think about this, one of your offspring, all right? So Eve's offspring would have been the son of Adam. And Jesus is known as the son of man. And what does Adam mean? Adam means man. So son of man, son of Adam is going to, be, is going to come. And Jesus said, I am that son of Adam. I am that son of man who was prophesied. This thing that you have heard about is being fulfilled in me. So Jesus gives the hope that we don't have to live under the yoke of sin. We don't have to be controlled by sin. This was the prophesied hope that they were waiting for. And Jesus said, this is fulfilled in me. That is the hope of Advent. That's the hope of Christmas. This isn't in your sheets because I messed up. But hope always begins with a promise from God. Again, it's not blind hope. What they were hoping for was what God had told them that there was going to come his offspring, and that was going to crush Satan's head, that the Spirit of Lord, the Lord would be on his son, and he would provide deliverance, he would provide freedom, he would provide restoration. All right, so when we talk about our biblical hope, it begins with God. It begins with what God has promised. It's not just something that we say, I hope I can overcome this addiction. No, God has given us that promise. God has given us that prophecy that we will overcome through him, and that's why we have that hope. It's an expectation. We can be free because God has set us free. All right, let's jump ahead. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, and then 10 through 11. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes out ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not, know and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the, fro the flock and devours it. All right, so contrast what Jesus says here about the hired man running away with what Jesus said he was coming to, the prophecy he was coming to fulfill, right? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified of them because the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you, all right? So this is the promise of a present hope. Just as the shepherd stays with the sheep, Right? The hired man runs away because he doesn't care what happens. He wants to save himself. Jesus is saying, I am that shepherd. I will never leave you or forsake you. Doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Doesn't matter how bad your life has gone. I am with you. Jesus is known as Emmanuel, God with us. All right? So he's saying, I am present with you. This is our present hope, the hope of God's presence. So prophesied hope becomes present hope. They were looking for the Savior to come. And now Jesus is saying, I am with you. And even better than that, I will never leave you. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. All right, what did Jesus say? He was fulfilling in Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to heal the sick. All of those things that he did, right, because he was no longer just the, the, 
hope that was to come, but he was the hope that was there. He was their present hope, their refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And the best example of this, again, there were so many that we could go through, is the woman who uh, had a problem with, with bleeding. So Mark chapter 25, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answer, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to him, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. But Otis, I thought we were talking about hope. He said your faith had healed you. Well, it was her hope, and it was her expectation. And I actually did a message about this years ago. The only one who would have been around to hear it would have been uh, Christina. That was back when I was preaching for Pastor Finney. But if we really know the whole story, um, faith and hope are conjoined twins, right? Siamese twins, and they're joined at the heart. If faith dies, hope dies. And if hope dies, faith dies. And if you don't believe that, Ask us a football fan, right? Because beginning of the year, so much faith. You know, we got the right quarterback this, this year. We got the right um, coach this year, right? Then all of a sudden, they're eliminated from the playoffs. They don't have any hope anymore. We got to get rid of that coach. He stinks. We got to get rid of our quarterback. He's the worst, right? Now, I mean, I've been a Philadelphian for 35 years. Until they won the Super Bowl, I hear that every year. This is our year. We got the dream team. We got the dream team. Not, not to bust on Philly fans. I'm, I'm a Philadelphia football fan, although a different team. And we're all the same, right? As soon as we lose hope, then we lose faith, then we lose our belief. So she had that hope, that expectation, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And that hope was fulfilled when she did that. So um, that's definitely out of sequence. So if hope dies, it takes faith sequence. Uh, it takes faith with it. The definition of faith, Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Okay, so faith is confidence, and it's the expression of the confidence that we have in our hope. There is no faith unless we have hope. And then what we do not see, again, that's that expectation, right? We have that hope. We know that it's grounded in truth. We haven't seen it yet. So faith and hope are hand in hand. Your faith has made you a whole. It was her hope that brought her to that point. But the reason I chose this story this is a very significant story because the, the woman in the crowd, Mark chapter 5, verse 24, what she went through physically is entirely symbolic of our spiritual condition. Now, to make this clear, this was not a parable. Jesus didn't tell this as a story with an application. However, just as we were talking about in Breakfast with Jesus with the lower story and the upper story, right, on the lower story, she was healed of a physical affliction, but what she went through speaks through everything that we go through in our spiritual lives and our spiritual journey, starting from the time that we don't know Jesus, all right? So she was sick. Um, what was sickness in her life is the illness of sin. And she expended all that she had. She went to all these doctors trying to get rid of that sickness. And that's the human condition. She expended all of her money, right? We, expend all, we spend everything that we have on, on distractions, you know, whether it's money, whether it's our energy, whether it's our time, Basically, we wake up, we, we, we grow up, and we're dissatisfied. We know that there's something wrong in our lives. So what do we do? Well, maybe we'll go and see a psychologist. You know, I just don't have any happiness. I feel that there's something wrong underlying my life. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to a psychologist, and, you know, I have recommended and would recommend as Christians that if we need somebody to talk to, we talk to somebody. But recognize that psychology isn't going to solve spiritual problems. All right. So then we say, well, I just need to have more fun. You know, I'll go out and I'll start dating or I'll go out and start drinking or, you know, medicating myself or all these other things. We're chasing after that. But that doesn't solve the spiritual problem. And then we think, well, if I had more money, if I had a better position, if I had power, we're chasing all of these things. But we are not attacking the true problem. 
Right? And this is the same thing. She was going to every doctor, every mind, trying everything that she could to get rid of this. But it was not until she approached Jesus that she was able to find the solution. So again, what she went through physically is what we go through is a spiritual journey that people have. We try everything that we can, but our only hope is a touch from God. When we touch God, then we can be delivered from that. Immediately she sensed that she had been delivered, and immediately we can have that hope, we can have that fulfilled when we touch God. All right, moving along quickly. Ooh, sorry. So Jesus came to them. This is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We've been talking about reach, teach, men, send for the past eight weeks, going back to this passage, the, uh, the Great Commission. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always. I am with you always to the very end of the age. So now we see that present hope. So we went from a prophesied hope to a present hope, and it has become a permanent hope, okay, that God will never leave us or forsake us. So the present hope is that promised hope. Jesus promises us that he will always be with us. And what a wonderful promise that we have that Jesus will never leave us. So it's not just, you know, for the Israelites back at that time. This isn't just a prophecy for Israel, but this is a prophecy for every generation. This hope spans generations until the end of the age. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Where Israel had the promised hope that Jesus would come, we have the promised hope that Jesus will stay. So we don't have to wait for another incarnation, Jesus coming as a child in the flesh again. The Jesus who came as the deliverer who died for our sins said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will be with you always. Jesus, God, is still with us. We're still living under that promise. But like Israel, we also have the promise of Jesus' coming. Now remember we said earlier that they had that blessed hope, which was Jesus the Messiah coming. Well, we also have the blessed hope that Paul talks about in Titus. And honestly, I only need verse 13, but man, this is one of the greatest passages of all literature, so I had to put it in there. One of the greatest passages of all literature, and it's also my second favorite passage from Titus. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, right? So God is present with us in this age, but here's the kicker. While we wait for the blessed hope the appearance of the glory of, the, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify him for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Okay? So the blessed hope is something that in, you know, church circles is known as the rapture. So the blessed hope in the Old Testament was that Jesus would come as a child. Our blessed hope is that Jesus will come as a conquering king and he will take, you know, these people home, um, those who have been waiting for and expecting his, hoping for his second coming. All right. First John 3, 1 through 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Love the fact that we have exclamation points here because this is great news, isn't it? The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, and the footnote there is, but we know that when it is made known, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that last verse is the kicker. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So what is this saying? This is a personal hope. This isn't just some abstract hope or some corporate church hope, you know, that the church has this hope that that God is going to be, uh, that, that we are the children of God. No, this is a hope for us individually. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now, up until the the most recent um, update of the NIV, this was everyone who has this hope, which shows more that it's an individual level. And I understand why they had to change it, because it's a little bit confusing. Um, All who have this hope in him, if we said everyone who had this hope in him, it's like 
that hope in me, but no, it's saying our, the object of our hope is not what I have in myself, not just my personal hope, but the hope of God. But understand, recognize, though, that this is a promise to us. This is an individual hope. It's not just the church is going to be delivered, but we individually will be delivered. Not just that the church can overcome, but that I can overcome any situation, any circumstance that I'm going through. Um, it is that personal, uh, that personal hope. All right, and what does John say? All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So here we see the purifying power of hope. I'm going to give you another verse. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who, gives you, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer for your hope. And that is the preachable power of hope. I'm just going to stop for a second and point out that every one of my points started with a P. All but two of them started with a PR, so good on me. No, but in all seriousness, so when we talk about the purifying power of hope and the preachable power of hope, I hope that we, hope, excuse me, no pun intended. I really wish that I have um, instilled into you, this should bring to your mind right away, Acts chapter 1, 8, right? When God says, you will receive power power of hope, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the ends of the earth, or all the ends of the earth. So we talk about power. What is that power? Power to lead a holy life, the power that purifies. The fruit of the Spirit is the purifying power of Christ. And then the gifts of the Spirit, the power to proclaim God's message, that's the preachifying power of God. So I got that PR in there, so I had to say preachify and make up the word, right? But so it is hope that makes us pure, it is hope that we defend. It is hope that we preach. When we talk about what we are going to get from the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, it is that power of hope. We don't have to live in hopelessness. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope is what makes us pure. Hope is the message that we bring. Hope is what brings deliverance. So let's never disregard that middle child again. Amen? All right, so how do we respond? And I ran out of space on your sheets, so you're going to kind of have to scribble it in. You used to have like the entire back sheet where you can write in your notes. But we always look up, we look down, we look to the left, and we look to the right. Looking up towards God, um, Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Is that my hope? Am I putting too much hope in my job? in my marriage, in my relationships, and, you know, my family's going to ba bail me out, is my tr hope truly in the Lord? And if I'm failing in that hope, if I, um, well, if, if I find that hope lacking, you know, that's the first thing to get, get, get straight. And then second, we talked about the power of hope to purify. Is hope purifying my life? Is hope changing my message, that preachifying power? Is it giving me the power to proclaim? Otherwise, I need to work on my hope, right? So, Maybe you never heard a pastor tell you that. You need more hope. If we're not seeing ourselves purify ourselves, if we're not seeing ourselves proclaiming God's message, that's a hope problem. That's a hope deficit. All right, look down towards where we are. Where is God leading me? I, I'm supposed to be an ambassador of hope wherever I go. You know, when I go to work and people are saying, oh, it's Monday again, or, you know, when I go to, um, I don't know, where do people go? Go to the, the supermarket. I can't believe I have to wait in this long line, right? But everywhere that I go, I should be carrying that message of hope. I should be saying, hey, isn't this great? This is Christmas time. You know what that means? Jesus loved us so much that he came and he lived with us. And we have the hope that we're going to see him again. And we have that present hope that he's with us even now. Everywhere I'm going, I should be carrying that message of hope. Look left towards people who don't know God. Um, how and where can I proclaim hope to the hopeless? Man, once again, going back to that story, that guy who went out and saw people who were in the same circumstances that he was in and told them that he could be free. Now, my story might not be as dramatic as that, but I still have that message of hope that I can tell people. You know what? I was in difficult times. I went through some dark times. Speaking person, I went through two very particularly dark periods in my life. But God was with me. I had that hope. And when I see people who are going through those same sorts of things, don't worry, don't worry about it. But, you know, just recognize that you have that hope. This isn't the end. God has promised us. It's not a blind hope. We have hope in the promise of what God has told us. And then finally, look to the right towards other in the, others in the body of Christ. I hope that my hope, I hope i got to stop saying hope. Uh, it is my aspiration that my hope is contagious. That's what we should be, be thinking. You know, when we come together as a church, 
We're to be building each other up in the, in the hope. Because sometimes people are going through circumstances. They're going through situations that are going to drag them down. They need your hope. Sometimes you need their hope as well, right? We bear one another's burdens. Others bear our burdens. And, you know, we, it's, it's like the body. When one part is suffering, other parts compensate for us. So this should be a place where that hope is renewed, that hope is restored, and that hope is built up. Let's be the people of the power of hope. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much that you loved us enough to be our present hope, our refuge and our strength, our present help in a time of trouble. We thank you for the hope that we have, not just for the present, but for the future, wherever you were leading us in this life and then in the life to come. Father, I pray that you would make that hope so real to us as we concentrate on you and on your sacrifice and on the fact that you decided to be with us. And Lord, that we would be ambassadors of that hope and of its power for the glory of your name. Amen.